Good morning, friends. How are you guys? Blessed, I heard it from over here. That's exciting. My name is Dylan Meyer. I'm the pastor of Next Gen here at Westview Community Church. Um, I am thrilled to be still in this series. I love this series. I'm a little bit biased, but that's okay. Um, I've been really enjoying our opportunity to look at the distinctions between an earthly culture and a heavenly culture. To look at the differences between what we assume and sometimes understand opposed to an understanding that is centered on Christ. And I, I have loved it. I have loved it. And, and we're going to be closing that up today um, in the book of Philippians. But before we get there, I want to talk a little bit about culture. Um, I love culture. This is why. I love that things are different in different cultures. I think if everything that was the same, it would be boring. And that is one of my frustrations with why we look at difference as such a negative thing. It, it disgusts me that when we look at other people that are different from us, we look at that as, it's, as if it's a negative thing. That's ridiculous. Um, and, and here's one of the reasons why. Different foods, thank goodness we have different cultures. That's fantastic. To experience them all, that's one thing. Uh, but also, to have relationships with people of different cultures gives me such a better understanding um, of humanity. Because it shows me the same things, but from a different perspective. Sometimes even just a different language. Um, here's a for instance. I have the opportunity to Zoom um, with a missionary family that, that um, we support here. Their, their name is George and Sherry Wirtz. I, I Zoom with two of their boys about once a month. So I, I get to talk with Nathan and Daniel um, about once a month, which the fact that I can hold an ongoing relationship and conversation with somebody in Cuenca, Ecuador, being in Manhattan and Kansas is, is such a blessing. But they can continuously teach me amazing things. I, I'm fairly certain that they thought that that relationship was supposed to work the other way around, that I was supposed to impart wisdom on them. <laughs> Got them, suckered. Um, but one of the things that they teach me is they teach me the difference in culture. Um, for instance, one of the things that's different is they don't Midwestern goodbye. Um, they're Ecuadorian, and so when they say bye, like three feet away from you, they turn their back and leave. They're done. Like, see ya, adios. I would prefer to slowly, like, slap my legs. Well, stand up, hold conversation, take two steps toward the door, hold conversation. And that, that's how my goodbyes go. It's about a 45-minute process, okay? Theirs is about 45 seconds, and most of that is them walking to the car. And that, that's, that's different, okay? So they teach me lots of things. Uh, but they also, they impress me. The fact that they are bilingual blows my mind. Because I took like three years of high school Spanish. I don't know almost any of that. You ask me, do you speak Spanish? You know say, I don't know. Um, they are on it. They have both of English and Spanish. They have it down so well that they can transition back and forth. Sometimes what seems like within the same sentence. That blows my mind. We were at CIY. We had the opportunity to take them with us to our high school camp this year in July. And there was a soccer tournament that was going on. It's four on four soccer. Let me tell you, people that play Ecuadorian soccer are just better than most of the American people are. That's just how that goes. It's a culture thing. That is their big focus. And they crushed it at CIY. They made so many people look so silly. They scored the majority of their goals between someone else's legs. Um, and the whole time they were doing that, the, Daniel and Nathan were holding conversation with each other, telling each other, I'm going to go here, pass the ball here. This is when I'm going to cut, where I'm going to go. This is how I want you to get me the ball. I want you to do a long pass instead of a lob pass. And they were doing all of that in Spanish. Okay? So they were holding communication. So they knew everything that was going to happen on the field, but they were the only ones that knew. And that, that was impressive. But I feel for them. I really do. Because language is difficult. Language is difficult. The words, specifically English, I think, is slightly more difficult and or stupid than most other languages. Because things just don't make sense. The way that we spell things and then the way that we say that, you can spell the same word 
exactly the same and say it two different ways, and it, it's correct. That's insane. It's so confusing. Um, and there are lots of words that we struggle to say. There are lots of words in the English language that are difficult. Here are a few words that our culture struggles to say. Please. I'm sorry. Thank you. Worcestershire sauce. <laughs> there are some things that we struggle to say. Maybe it's because we don't say it often or nobody knows how to say it. There, there are things that in our culture that we struggle to say. Thank you, I think, is a big one. I think we struggle in our culture to say that word. Maybe because it's, we just expect things. That's just how it's supposed to go. Gratitude seems like an extra step. It's over the top for something that should just happen. A thank you isn't required. I think sometimes we get in a space where we expect, assume, or almost entitle ourselves with a right to things. And because of that, we, we lose sight of offering a thank you in response. I don't think we say thank you enough. But many of us are going to be in a spot, maybe later this week, around a Thanksgiving table where somebody's going to ask you the question, what is one thing that you are thankful for? What is one thing that you are grateful for? Some of us have that on the tip of our tongue. Some of us are going to have to think for a while. And so that's my question for you today. I want you to look at your Connect card, write that down in the sermon note spot. Um, what is one thing that you're grateful for today? I'll give you time, don't worry. I'm not going anywhere. What is one thing that you are grateful for? When I was thinking about this question, a couple things came to mind. One of them was a song. The song, I Thank God by Maverick City, is, is a song that I'm consistently thankful for. And, and there's a reason for that. Every time I hear that song, I, I'm pulled back to an experience that I had where that song was present. Um, Olivia had an opportunity to, to preach at a junior high conference um, at a church in Illinois. And so we went back there, and, and she was preparing to speak. And I think it was the night before, there, there was a speaker there, which was crazy because I, I knew him from when I was a freshman in high school and he was at church camp with me and like I knew that he was headed for ministry but it was nowhere near like my mindset and so to randomly run into him and to tell my high school camp counselor like hey like not only do I still love Jesus but like he called me into ministry and we were able to have like a pastoral talk the two of us that was so cool. But he, he delivered the message that night and, and, and the opportunity for the junior high students to respond, they played, I thank God. And what they wanted, they, what they were inviting the students to do was to come forward and to take a large rock and throw it in a metal trash can. It was loud and obnoxious. But the idea was that they would be willing to surrender the weight of their life regardless of how loud it was to those around them. That they would not be deterred from that by everyone else's opinions. And for 45 minutes, these students continued one by one, two by two, to move toward Jesus and throw that stone. For 45 minutes, they added like five bridges to this song and then played two or three others. It was very, very, I, I'm speechless to describe what that experience was like. To continue to watch sixth, seventh, eighth grade students making the most, most important decision they'll ever make for 45 minutes minutes they continued to move and every time there was a lull another one would stand up another one would stand up and because of that every time I hear that song I'm immediately pulled back to that one of the other things that came to mind was the relationship that I have with Nathan Wirtz uh, he, he went with us to CIY and he, uh, yeah he played amazing soccer 
But he also was just, he was such a strong and consistent guy in our group. He would help with small group conversation, and, and we had so many good discussions late at night. But one of the most important things to me was um, we had somebody step into our, our group that day in, in between things and play a silly, stupid game with us. And, and that person, I don't think, really felt included in, in many of the groups that they had tried to be a part of. And for some reason, that silly, stupid game for us helped him feel connected. And, and again, after the message that night, they had an opportunity to respond. I think they could actually respond before, during, or after the message. And during the message, there was the sound of a chain hitting the floor. That was the response that I was to stand on a wooden plank and hold a heavy chain to, to feel the weight of sin and then let it go. And they were encouraged to take someone with them to help them make that decision. And, and in the middle of the sermon, you hear this heavy chain hit the wood. And I looked over there, and it was that young man standing there then with nothing in his hands. And Nathan works with his hand on his shoulder. That boy sought him out of the crowd because he felt like he belonged with him. And that was somebody that could help him make that decision to take one step closer to Christ that day. And he dropped the chain. And I remember thinking, what a guy. What a guy for Nathan to allow God to use him in that way. And, and there's, there's lots of things, honestly, that I could tell you I am thankful for this. There's lots of th ways in which God has stepped into moments in my life where I felt like there was nowhere to go, no way out. And, and he provided a way. And circumstances that I felt like were impossible and God overcame them in my life. There's, there is so many. And yet some days when I wake up, I can't think of a single one. There are some days where I wake up and if someone were to ask me, what are you thankful for? I would stare at them blankly for probably 20 minutes. I have no idea. You see, sometimes I have so many reasons to be thankful and sometimes thankful, thank you, gratitude is so far from my lips because bitterness is the only thing on my tongue. There are times where it is tough, it is exhausting, and I feel like it is uphill both ways in the snow, in the wind, and I probably broke my leg. There are some days that I just can't do Tuesday. And I feel like that's where we find ourselves sometimes. Have you guys ever had a bad day? Have you guys ever had a day where you felt like you couldn't go any longer? Have you ever had a day where you felt like you did not have what was going to be required of you that day? See, there, there are days where we are so far down in the pit that we can't see a way out. There are days that we have grown weary of the good work that is happening within us, and it would be so much more comfortable in our exhaustion just to give up, to let go, to call it quits, to end that journey, because we're not sure if we're really going to make it to the destination or not. There are times that we're not sure that we can. There are times that we are so overwhelmed by all that is bad that we can't see the good anymore. Or maybe it's the opposite. And maybe we've arrived at something that gave us great reason for thanks. But now it's old instead of new. And now it's mundane instead of exciting. And now it's just another ordinary blessing. And it tastes just as bad as yesterday's leftovers did. Because it was good in the moment. The first time I had that, I was, I was so excited. I think of leftovers. I, I can smell it on the stove when I walk in the house and it smells so good. I'm so excited. I'm so hungry. I know that I need that. When I sit down, I'm so excited for it. And I eat until I'm full. Sometimes past that, and it hurts a little bit. But the next day, when I pull that out of the fridge and take it to work, it doesn't taste the same. It's not as good as it was. And all of a sudden, instead of something that I'm excited for, it's something that I'm dreading. Because I want something new. 
Sometimes there's th what seems like good reasons for us to struggle to be thankful. And, and we're going to look at Paul's letter to the Philippians today to, to see how does he address thankfulness because he begins this letter like he does at least five others with a prayer of thanksgiving. And it's not because his life was all peaches and cream. He does not begin with thanks because everything in his life was perfect, smooth sailing without trouble, struggle, or difficulty. It's actually quite the opposite. For this letter specifically, he's in prison in Rome. He's writing from prison. And in another one of his letters, he gives you a resume of the difficulty that he has dealt with. He says, three times I was beaten with rods. Oh, I missed some. Sorry. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less than one. 40 was supposed to kill you. 39 was, you're barely alive. Five times he received that. Three times he was beaten with rods. Once he was stoned. Three times he was shipwrecked. A night and a day he was adrift at sea. And on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, dangers from his own people, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, danger at sea, dangers from false brothers, toil and hardship through many sleepless nights, and hunger and thirst, and often without food, in cold and exposure. Sounds like smooth sailing to me, yeah? So why is he thankful? Why is he thankful? If, he, if he's already experienced all of this, and then again now in prison, why does he begin this letter with thanks? Because Paul is an expert at validating reality. You see, that's one of my favorite things about Paul, is he's willing to validate the ugly. He's willing to validate that everything isn't peaches and cream. Because some days, I don't feel like I'm having a good day. And if somebody was to completely ignore that and try to show me the silver lining, it would drive me nuts. Because you're not listening to me. You're not hearing me. And when I feel unheard and misunderstood, I get upset. And so Paul does a really good job of validating that there is struggle. Five times, 39 lashes. Good golly, man. He validates sometimes things stink. Sometimes things are difficult. He validates the reality of the good, but also the bad and the ugly, but also the divine and the supernatural and eternal. You see, Paul validates reality as it is, which means that, yes, there are some times that things are difficult. Yes, we will face things that are inevitably bigger than us. There are days where we wake up and Tuesday is too much for me. There are days where the financial stress that I'm dealing with is too much for me. There are days where I have to wake up at three o'clock in the morning because the baby's crying and I should have slept like four days ago. Like I am in desperate need of a nap and something is required of me that I do not have. There are days where I am dealing with a spiritual giant that is bigger than I am. There are days that I am trying to overcome something that I am desperately incapable of doing. There are days where what I am staring at is bigger than me. But what Paul knows, and what I now know, is that I have never woken up and saw something standing that was bigger than my God. You see, there are days where, where I wake up and what is standing in front of me is too big for me, but it is not too big for God. There are days that I have woken up and I have never seen a day that was too big for Jesus. I have never looked at the cross, looked at the power that he had to overcome death and thought, yeah, Wednesday is probably too much for him. I have never run into something that is too big for him. I run into stuff all the time that's too big for me. And that's... That's the reality. We will encounter struggle, but we'll never encounter something bigger than God. And that is reason for thanks. And so Paul begins his letter to the Philippians. He begins it this way. Chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, 
with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart and you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in my defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve of what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. He shows us how to posture ourselves for gratitude. Because in the midst of all of these things, he sees right through it. In the midst of all of the circumstances that are less than stellar, he sees right through it and he sees to what God is up to. In the midst of circumstances, God has a plan, a purpose, a hope, and a future. And that is what Paul is clinging to because he remembers how God has moved in the past. And that faithfulness is still faithfulness now. And that is what he is clinging to. And so Paul thanks them. In every prayer, the same guy that talks about praying without ceasing. That's a lot of thanks, man. He says that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Verse six, it began a good work. Be thankful, he will finish it. There, there's times that I don't know that it's going to get done. I mean, look at my bathroom. There's a, a corner in my bathroom that I have yet to mud and drywall. Partially because I hate drywall, but also because sometimes it... If I'm not certain that I have what it takes, I just quit and don't do it. I push it off. I procrastinate. And so there are days where when I look at the good work that God desires to do within me, I'm like, that's not happening today, dude. Because I'm only looking at what I'm bringing to the table. You see, God's ability to finish the good work is not a dependent upon our own strength, but on our surrender to the power and will of Holy Spirit. You see, it's not just in my strength that something is going to get done. It's not just what I'm bringing to the table that's going to accomplish this thing. And sometimes I really wish that by God's power I could have my will. But that's not how that works. You see, if we're going to do this good work, it has to be God's power in God's will. It has to be His will, His way. And that's a struggle for me. Because I like things in my hands. I like things that I can control. I like things where the outcome is what I set it out to be. But that's not what's best. And the kingdom of man will never be more than that unless we surrender to the rule and reign of God in our hearts and lives. It will never be better than what it is right now unless we let go and give it to Jesus. Our control isn't working. And so trust and be thankful that he will finish what he has begun. And when it is difficult, don't give up on him. And then he continues in his prayer and says this in verse 9, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more. One of the most beautiful descriptions of, of God that I've heard is just simply that God is love. And so if we were to allow his good work to be done within us, would we not look more and more like love? Would we not look more and more like Christ who is love? Full of mercy, full of grace, full of compassion. Would those things be what we looked like? If we clothed ourselves in Christ... 
Because sometimes we get really hung up on doing this good work in truth, but truth is not apart from love when it is within the character of Christ. And I think sometimes we use the sword of truth to cut down what God desires to be standing. Then he continues that they would have all knowledge and discernment. Knowledge and discernment, in my opinion, is rooted in heavenly wisdom, not earthly. You see, earthly wisdom is limited, is temporary, and is corrupted. Heavenly wisdom is eternal, it is true, and it is anointed by God's will. And so, there's my plug for you to know his word. Because if we know the voice of God, we hear it when we are seeking direction. And so when we need wisdom, when we need knowledge, when we need discernment, if we know his voice, we hear it when he speaks. Which had me thinking in our GPS society, there's times where I really need direction in my life. There's times where I've run into the same barricade over and over and over again, and that's why I'm bitter. That's why I am not thankful, is because I am stuck in this place. And I wonder, if, am I getting my directions from the right person? I, I haven't touched a paper map in forever, but I have a GPS. Would I hear my GPS if God's voice was the voice? Because it, it doesn't matter where we're at. If I hear Siri start speaking, oh, I know that's Siri. Would it be the same? If God was the voice of my GPS, would I recognize his voice like that? Would I listen to where he's directing me? And then Paul tells us in that knowledge, in that discernment, to accept all things that are excellent, to approve of what is excellent so that we can be pure and blameless. I was thinking on that. And he, he says later in Philippians chapter four, he talks about what it is to be pure and blameless. And, and I think about these things because this is my prayer over my daughter pretty consistently. My, my wife and I get around her and we pray that she would continue to be pure and blameless as she is. Her innocence is such a beautiful thing and I dread that being taken away from her. And so I pray this over her and, and Paul does such a beautiful job of telling us what that is. He says, finally, brothers, this is in chapter four, he says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is anything excellent, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. That is what makes us pure and blameless. If we would set our heart and our mind on those things, if we would fix our eyes on Christ, because those are all descriptors of who God is, would we be who he desires us to be? And then Paul goes on to say that we would bear the fruit of righteousness. I immediately think of fruit trees. I'm not gonna lie, I'm struggling with trees right now because I've raked my yard of leaves like seven times and there's always more. And so trees and I have a pretty bitter relationship right now. Not very thankful for them. But scripture consistently uses this imagery of a fruit tree. And, and scripture uses it so well to speak to so many different things. But what I want to encourage you in this place is you only bear fruit if you are placed in a spot where you are getting nourishment. Sometimes I am so thankful for how God transplanted me from that ugly life that was before into the life that I have now, and yet sometimes I still pick up my tree and I wander into the desert where there is nothing good for me. And then I wonder, why do I not have fruit? Why am I not bearing fruit in this space? And the ugly truth is, a tree that is a barely alive doesn't bear fruit. And so, I would encourage you to seek nourishment, but in that is, a wise person once told me that self-care is not selfish. God loves you. Why should you not love yourself? Do not let that be the thing hindering you from bearing fruit. 
See, we can be thankful because God brings his good work to completion. And within God's will, it was, it is, and it is to come. And, and there are times that it is hard to see out of the pit, that we can't see what we ought to be thankful for. Thank goodness that we are not limited by sight. Now, faith is assurance of things hoped for and conviction of things not seen. If you are stuck in the pit, be thankful that God is with you because I promise you that he is. But also have faith for what is outside that you cannot see. And I don't know about you guys, but maybe you're like me. And I'm really good at making one good decision. But don't ask me to make two. I, maybe I can make two good decisions, but three is kind of a stretch. Maybe I can make three decisions, but sometimes when I'm on good decision 47, and it's getting really difficult, I'm in a space where I feel like I'm going to break. And that's when the bad decision starts to seem really nice. Because sometimes I'm in a spot where the good decision is difficult. And the, the next good decision is maybe even a little bit harder. And I don't know about you guys, but difficult and uncomfortable are not my friend. And there are times where I am under tension. There are times where I am under strain. And I don't like it. Even if it's what's best for me. And, and God was teaching me about this this week. Because oftentimes I am not thankful in the moment for how he is growing me for the future. And, and I was thinking, because right now there, there's lots uh, of workouts and physical enthusiasts that are talking about the benefits of when you lift weights, spending time under tension. The idea here is that you don't just move a lot of weight quickly, but that you hold the weight and you hold it in tension. Because as your body strains for that, it creates a denser muscle fiber. It develops strength and stamina. It is beneficial for so many different things. But that time under tension is difficult. And, and similar to that thought is this idea of training until failure. You spend time under tension until you cannot any longer, and then you go a little bit further and then a little bit further until you just give way and the truth of the matter is is that's not just how we train our bodies that's how God trains our spirits so you see there are times where we spend time under tension and God is saying would you just hold on a little bit longer I know that you want to quit and give up because it's uncomfortable but if you would just hold on a little bit longer and if we would cling to that if we would stay in that space under tension, we would recognize that he is growing our capacity for what is next. Because if I can lift 20 pounds now, if I can hold that 20 under tension, I can lift 40 the next time. And there is something that God has you holding right now that is uncomfortable. It is killing you. And you feel like if you hold on even just a little bit longer, you'll die. You won't be able to make it. You can't do it. But what I promise you is that this is just the training for what's next. God is stretching the vessel. He is preparing you for a hope and a future that he has a good work inside of you that isn't done yet. And so if you would hang in that tension, what is next would be that much better. And that is my hope and my prayer. Because I don't know about you guys, but as a person, I feel under tension. There are days where I am at the end of myself. I, I had an interview this last spring um, for ordination where they were asking me kind of the final questions of like, are you worthy to do what we're asking you to do? Talk about a frightening conversation to have. And I, I walked into the room and they said that they noticed something different about me the way that I carried myself, the way that I spoke, the way that I held conversation with them. And appropriately, I gave thanks to Christ because the truth of the matter is, in this last year, I have been in so many different places and spaces where I have been at the end of myself, incapable of doing anything that is left, stuck in that time under tension, and I can't go a step further. And in that place of desperation, I am able to reach out to the only one that is able to make a way. And I told them that I have been at the end of myself, and at the end of my, myself, I found him. 
because he's the only one that's capable. And so I don't know what pit you're in or what difficulty you're sitting with or how long you've been holding it, but what I can tell you is that he is holding you holding it. And thank God for that because I don't know about you guys, but it's not just like that for me. I know that some of you have been dealing with similar things because it's not just a me thing. My wife and I have been in that same space with different things where our family just can't hold any more and then he makes a way. And we have been in a space under tension where we have been stretched beyond what we are capable of in ourselves. And I know it's not just us because when I look around this church, I hear the stories. I see your face when I ask you, how are you? I see that you've been carrying burdens that you cannot hold by yourself. And what I promise you is that he is holding you in that space. And if you'll just hang on a little bit longer, he is stretching you for what is next. He is preparing you for his will and his way. And it is my hope and my prayer because we need it. We need that. Westview needs to be different. This church needs to be different. The church as a whole needs to be a different culture because what is happening right now isn't making the cut. And I don't know about you guys, that time under tension I can't handle things as they are. But what I know is that he's making a way. And if there's a good work stuck inside of you, he is bringing it to completion. And it will be beautiful. And it is my hope and my prayer that you don't give up on him. Don't give up on him. Hang on until you have something to be thankful for. So if you are empty, be thankful because the Lord knows how to fill an empty vessel. If you are exhausted, be thankful because the most high God is the power in your veins. If you are weary of ordinary blessings, be thankful because leftovers are just as nourishing today as they were yesterday. I don't know where you're at, but God desires our gratitude in all circumstances. God desires our gratitude. But we are not alone in that space. You are not alone in the pit. You are not alone holding that weight. God is a compassionate God. He is suffering with us. He is our high priest who empathizes with us. He is our friend who sits and listens to us. He is our warrior fighting for us. He is our champion claiming victory ahead of us. He is our completion making us whole. And in that space, he calls us to the table of thanks. The table of thanksgiving. Some of us are a little bit confused because this is communion two weeks in a row, and that's a weird thing. We don't do that. Last week, we focused on communion. Same sacrament, different focus. Sacrament's a $5 church word for a physical way that we encounter God's grace. And so this sacrament, this physical way that we encounter the body and the blood of Christ, communion is focused on being there with Jesus. It's close, it's intimate, and it needs to be. This week, we're gonna focus on Eucharist. There's an $8 church word for you. That is Greek, and the root of that is thanksgiving. When we come to this table of thanksgiving, this Eucharist moment, we come with a posture of gratitude for what God has done for us. Because his faithfulness yesterday is a profession of faith for tomorrow. And that testimony holds true. And the beautiful thing about this is it's rooted even in the elements. You're gonna come forward and you're gonna grab a piece of bread. It's not just bread. That is a symbol of God's faithfulness, not only in your life, but through all of time. When it it talks in the Old Testament about the unleavened bread that they had just before he delivered them at Passover and he leads the Israelites out of Egypt, that bread he wants us to remember that faithfulness. When they were wandering in the desert and they had nothing to eat and he gave them manna, bread from heaven, that is a symbol of his faithfulness, not just now, but to come. And then Jesus came as the body, the bread of life. It's not just bread to be thankful for. And and then you're going to grab a cup, 
A cup that represents the sacrifice that covers our sins. The blood that washes us clean. The blood of a new covenant that gave us a new kind of relationship with our heavenly Father. That the most high God would not be far away. Blood that represents new wine. Holy Spirit inside of us growing and stretching this wineskin. And so God has been faithful and he will not fail. And so as you move forward to the tables, I would encourage you to move in a posture of gratitude that you would set your heart to be grateful for what he is doing in you. I don't know what you wrote on your connect card. I don't know what that one thing is that you are thankful for. But I hope as we center our eyes on Christ, even if we can't see it with our eyes, but only in faith that we would understand that we have reason to be grateful. I would encourage you that this is an open table. If you feel God nudging you to move, move. You guys can come in a posture of gratitude. How could I explain?
Jesus is inviting us to the table. The same way that he invited his disciples to the table. Oh, if they would have known what they were being stretched for. Oh, if they would have known what would happen as they left that room. I can only imagine what they were feeling, understanding, watching it, feeling it hit not just their head, but their heart as they understood that his body broken was the cross. His blood shed was the cross. I can't imagine what it was like to know in that moment, to feel so alone in that moment. But then after, knowing that that had to take place, being filled with the Spirit and laying the foundation for the church as we know it. Eleven guys in a room were stretched, filled, purposed for something that they could not see and something that we are sitting in today. That is a good work. So I don't know where you are at or what you are being stretched for, but Jesus is inviting you to the table. Please grab the bread. Jesus said this to his disciples while they were eating. Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take it, this is my body. Please take the cup. Then he took the cup. He gave thanks and he offered it to them and they drank from it. He said, this is the blood of my covenant which is poured out for many. When I look at this opportunity to come to the table, I view it as our opportunity to come to Jesus, to move toward Jesus. But what happens next is we leave the table, just as the disciples left the upper room. And then they moved with Jesus for whatever he had in store next. And, and that is the posture of our offering, is that it is my hope and prayer that this has been a safe sanctuary place for you to come, come to Jesus, to be refreshed, refueled, repurposed. But as we leave from this place, is my hope and prayer that we would not leave the table without him, but we would allow him to continue his good work within us. And that's our offering today. Whatever he is asking of you, allow him to accomplish it in you and through you. And, and may I take this opportunity to say thank you. Because in, in my humble opinion, I know that what I think means the world to you. That was a sarcasm. You are doing well. You, you are doing this so well. When I look at what happens here, I have no way to reasonably explain it other than the fact that God is moving in you and through you. Your offering in this place, in this space, the posture of your heart is moving this church. So allow me to say thank you. Thank you for what you do for each other. Thank you for what you do for the staff. Thank you for what you do for the volunteers that give their time, energy, and effort to serve Christ. And you are a part of that. And allow us the opportunity to give you more opportunities. There's an angel tree up this week we decorated for Christmas. You're welcome. Merry Christmas. That is an opportunity to serve the people that are represented on that tree. Of those is the homestead girls. 
the, his international students and what we call benevolence, but I'm just going to say the many. Because when Jesus says that his blood was poured out for many, that is who is represented in that third category. And I don't lump them to put a label on them, but I, I lump each one of those to say that that is who our heart is for in this space and in this season. And so as you leave from here, I would encourage you, there's a table out there in the west lobby. Go there. If God says take an ornament, take one. If he says take seven, take seven. Just make sure you write all those down on the paper thing that's next to it. If he tells you to do that, I'm not inclined to disagree with him. If you think about that and you discern with that and he says, no, that's not for you. I want you to do this instead. I'm not inclined to disagree with him. And so I want you to leverage that which you are grateful for. Your time, your talent, your resources, your relationships. That's a new one for me. Understanding that the way that I invest in relationships impacts the kingdom. Those are the things that we are grateful for. This is the last thing that I'll say that God, God has been teaching me Last, last week, I was cleaning my laundry room for the 800th and 77th time. And I was bitter about it. And I felt God nudge me. And he said, gratitude and stewardship go hand in hand. He says, if you are thankful for the home in which I have given you, care for it. The same way in which Paul cared for the churches. We are to care for that which we are grateful for. And so if you care about it, invest in it. If you don't feel the need to invest, I'll challenge you to sit with that also. Gratitude and stewardship go hand in hand. Whatever God is asking of you today, move with him toward that. Will you guys pray with me? God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to come to the table and to, to be made aware of all that that I cannot see. To be made aware of all the good works that you are beginning in each and every one of us, that you are stretching us as vessels to fill us more fully. And God, I thank you for that. I thank you for time under tension. And so, God, I just pray that you would meet us in this place. That if we don't feel that we have anything to be thankful for, that we would be thankful for your presence. And if we can't see it, Lord, if we can't see it, Lord, help us feel it. Encourage us. Let us know that you are there and you are with us. And God, I pray that as we leave this space, that we would leave it more fully that we would leave it with a good work inside of us that allows for love to abound more and more. Father, we love you, we thank you, and we give you the praise because you are the only one that is worthy. Amen. We want to teach you a new song as we head out uh, today. This is one I've had it kind of in the queue for a while, but I was waiting for the right message, the right Sunday, where it really brought it together, and this is it. This whole song you're going to hear in the lyrics about, it's going to reference Daniel in the lion's den, and Paul in prison, and shackles, and David staring down a, a Goliath, a giant, and it talks about how God is worthy of our praise in every circumstance. And I think um, it's, e it's easy to praise him when you, know, when you get the steak dinner, or whatever meal Dylan was referencing as our firsts, and it's a little harder when we're stuck with the leftovers or in a harder season. And um, so in this week of Thanksgiving, lots of talk about things to be thankful and grateful for, but sometimes that's hard in whatever season. And that, I think, is when our praise sounds the sweetest to Jesus' ears. He loves our praise all the time, but how sweet it is to him to see us in a valley and yet still proclaiming his goodness. So let's stand. We want to sing this with you today. Sometimes you've got to dance through the darkness, sing through the fire, praise when it don't make sense. Sometimes you've got to stare down the giant, worship from the lion's den. Sometimes
Sometimes you've got to shout from the mountain Louder in the valley Trusting that he's gonna get you there Sometimes you've got to welcome the wonder Wait for the answer Worship with your hands in the air I'll praise you anywhere Praise, give me praise, give me praise In the highest praise Give me praise, give me praise scripture from Philippians. This is chapter 423. It says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And when you break that down, when you want to know what that scripture is really saying, I found this amplified version that says, the grace of God rains down on us from the Lord's throne. And that grace is what will draw the world to our lives to hear our testimonies. So go out with the grace that God is raining down on us and share our testimonies. Have a great week. If you stop at the angel tree, make sure you sign up on the sheets with the ornament you took. We'll see you next week.